Now this isn't so much for my subscribers that have been with me for some time. This is for a new crowd that might have stumbled onto our channel. And what I want to talk about is the camper that you're currently setting on and why it's setting idle and what we're trying to do to change that. What have you been up to? I've been riding on a daydream. YouTube, thanks for checking out RV Daydream. And for you current subscribers, this is going to be a little bit of a rehash. So if you want to tune out of this, I understand entirely. What I'm trying to do on this video is address people that might be thinking about going full time. There's quite a few videos that are already on YouTube that talk about full time RVing and why you may want to do that and things you need to look at as far as going full time and jobs and all the specifics. But what I'm doing is putting up a video that might be a slightly different perspective than most and that is basically a Midwesterners take on the whole RV thing. Now there are other Midwesterners that have channels that are even from this own state. But what I wanna talk about is the overall feeling and the overall process, the overall idea of why you may wanna do this. So you might be able to relate to it as a fellow Midwesterner because there is a lot of channels that are putting out videos that talk about going full-time RVing and they are of the Western category of the country. <laughs> They're from you know, Oregon or Washington State or California, somewhere where the views might be looked at as a little flaky and hippie by Midwesterners. Not that they are, I just think they're different views. And the views that I have really are in line with theirs. It's just I think that I might say it in a manner that you could relate to a little bit if I give you a little bit of background about myself to some extent and what I think about the whole process. So first, I'm sure you're asking, well, why do you think that there's a difference? Why do you think that the West Coast might think differently than the East Coast or Midwesterners? Well, it's because I think personally, that the West Coast does have a different outlook on things. And the example I'm gonna give you is my grandfather and I fishing. My grandfather and I fished quite a bit from as young as I could hold a fishing pole all the way up until I was 13. Now my grandfather did die early as far as his age was concerned, but I did spend quite a few years with my grandfather over the summer and on and off through the holidays to where we would always go and talk with each other. I worked with him. I helped him build stuff. He showed me how to do things. And of course, whenever you're out fishing, that's a lot of chatting that's going on. You know, not too loud though, as my grandfather said, you're scaring the fish away. So we would talk a lot. We would talk about all kinds of different things. And the fact that he was born in 1919, there was a lot of things that he talked about that he was taught by either his father or grandfather that stayed with me as far as morals, as far as outlooks and ideas and ways of thinking. And those people, my grandfather's grandfather or my great great grandfather, you got to realize that when they were born, when they were talking to him when they were coming up with these ideas uh, you know they had lived through an era that california the transcontinental railroad hadn't even been finished at that point so there's a lot of people that are my age or older that had those similar experiences with their grandfather who in turn had their experiences with their grandfather or great-grandfather that they got the same kind of information given to them, but these are people that were actually settling that part of the country. These were people that lived in a time that there were still Native American lands. These are people that lived in an area that was still rugged and uncharted for the most part and was just being settled. So just from the point of hand-me-down information being given from grandfather to grandson and from grandson to son and then from son to the next son all that information rubs off on you i mean when my grandfather told me something i remembered it for the most part i mean he taught me lessons in life he taught me things that i should do and not do so you got to realize that there are people that are again my age and older 
that are now on YouTube, just like me, talking about why they think things should be and the way that they've lived their lives, they were brought up differently. They were brought up by a different type of a person than maybe a Midwesterner was brought up by. So let me tell you this, my great grandfather was a farmer and then my grandfather was a machinist. He was also a traveling preacher. My grandmother, she worked in a factory and then she went on to work in a high school cafeteria and she was a head cook for many, many years until they both retired. My dad worked as a UAW millwright for the Chrysler stamping plant in Twinsburg. And he always taught me, just like my grandfather did, that you need to go to work you need to find a good job, you need to work hard, you need to move up the ladder, you need to earn all the money that you can, and then you will retire and get to enjoy your retirement life. Fast forward to whenever I was in high school and I had quite a few jobs, I was earning as much money as I could, and I was getting ready to graduate, and my father told me there was a chance that he could get me into the UAW and get me into the Chrysler stamping plant, but there was a process that was involved. And through that process, it was going to be difficult, but he would do whatever he could as long as I did well on the testing, which I did, but there was such a large amount of people all vying for this job that paid really well. This job started at like $35,000 a year and you were only like part-time, you were getting laid off quite a bit at that point. And that was great money considering that I was working for $2.70 an hour because I was only part-time at one of my jobs in high school. Um, everything else was paid under the table. That money was just, you know, obscene at that point. And then of course, if you work there for a few years and you become a journeyman, then at that point, you're making 60,000 a year plus full benefits. And it was the UAW, you know how that goes. You get time and a half and triple time for working holidays. I mean, it was just something that I really looked forward to, but I didn't get the job after trying two separate times and my dad pulling all the strings that he could and I am glad that I didn't. Now, why in the world would I be glad about that? Well, it's because the way my life turned out after that. Shortly after that, I was trying to find something that was pretty stable, something that I wanted to do, maybe something that would give me benefits. So I wanted to try my hand at the armed services, just like my father, just like my grandfather, just like my uncles and my older brother. I decided to join the armed services, in my case, the army. and. It was a great experience. I learned a lot. I got to see parts of the US that really opened my eyes to travel. I got to see other parts of the world that really opened my eyes to other cultures. And I was really excited about the potential of traveling and seeing more of our country because even though I was overseas, I really liked what I got to see there, but I realized how much more of the US there was than this small country that I was in and I was hoping that I could see more of the US. So I was glad that I didn't get that job or I probably would have never joined the army and got to see the things that I did and make me want to travel and interact with our country the way that I do currently. So after I got out of the service, I decided that I was going to try to find a job that again was in the same line of what I was always taught, a factory, a big business, something that was going to get me security, something I could work at for the rest of my life, maybe give me a pension, but definitely give me enough money that I could buy things, I could accumulate things, I could get a big house, and it just never seemed right. The more I got, the more I worked, the harder I worked, and a lot of the jobs, I realized they were just working me to death. They, they took advantage. If you were a hard worker, you got more responsibilities. And being a Midwesterner, we like to think ourselves a pretty tough crowd and we kind of think of that as baptism by fire and that we're forging ourselves. You know, the harder they are on us and the harder I have to work, the more reward I'm going to get out of it. Somehow, whether it be money, whether it be whenever I retire and the relaxation that comes after working that hard, finally being able to relax, I was really getting wore down. And then after moving around quite a bit and landing a job I really liked and I thought for sure that I was going to stay at the rest of my life, the big change. I had a national reduction in workforce at my place of business or that I worked at and they let 450 of us go that day immediately. And I was 
shocked. I didn't even know what to think. Now, I had always done a little bit of repair business off to the side. Once they let me go, that's when I realized that I need to take and make my business at home a full-time business so I'm never, ever left in the hands of somebody else and let them dictate how much money I earn and if I'm even going to work that day or even that year. So that realization of opening my own business and that first year of me having my business, I've never worked so hard and it's never been so rewarding. I loved it. It was just incredible that I dictated the amount of time that I would dedicate towards my work day and basically how much money I was going to get in turn. That was really the realization that I didn't have to follow the guidelines that my father and my grandfather had taught me. They taught me a certain way. I trusted what they said. The problem was is times have changed and their ideas and their thoughts on the matter probably would have changed with it, but I was still going by honoring thy father and listening to what was being said and thinking that I had to get that type of job. It was the second time really that I got dissuaded by what was told to me. My father always told me, try to get a desk job because if you don't, you're going to be a hard, slaving, sweaty worker for somebody. The people that sit at desk, they have it made. So whenever I did get my very first job, basically, out of the Army, I did do some sort of laboring, but I finally worked my way to a desk job, and I sat at a desk for darn near 15 years, and it was the worst experience of my life. And again, I was thinking, wow, my father told me to do this, and it was horrible. And that's when I went into my second type of job, and that's when I was working with my hands, and I loved the job, but then whenever I got cut, and I got sent back out into the workforce with really no money to my name and all this stuff to pay for, that's when I had my second epiphany of, wait a minute, I don't need to work for anybody, I'm going to work for myself. So now, fast forward all these years, and I've got the same attitude towards the home now. And that started a few years back. And the way it started is just like maybe you are right now watching this video. There was a gentleman that I was watching his video and it, the guy's name is Ron Allard. He has a channel on YouTube and it's nothing fancy. It's him just sitting down talking about what he's going through day to day. The video that I saw, which was a few years back, was this gentleman sitting poolside, an in-ground pool that was at his home in an enclosed screen porch and his RV in the background and living what looked to be a lifestyle that I was thinking would be something that I would do once I retired and that was in the warmer climate having a nice home with an in-ground pool so I could enjoy the weather and enjoy myself on a daily basis and he said he was moving out of that home into his RV that he was going to be selling his home and moving into the RV and I was riveted. It struck a chord with me. I really related to what he was saying more than anything else that I saw on YouTube that had that kind of dialogue going on. And the reason was, I think, because I related with him. Here was a person I could see myself to be in another 30 years. And he's telling us, I'm moving away from this and I'm moving into my RV so I can travel and I can reduce my expenses and I can live what I think is a better life. Now Ron doesn't travel a lot, but for the most part he is doing what I want to do and that is move out of a home environment and into this other situation to where you're in a home that can travel anywhere in the country. The problem that we all fall into, especially again from people that are in my age group, that's from an era of growing up of overindulgence. Uh, the 90s was crazy. The 80s we were taught to just buy and buy and buy and the 90s when we got old enough we pretty much did. You know, I spent so much money on so many things and looking back 
I have no idea why I did. I still have stuff that I've yet to get rid of that is going to be gone eventually, but these are things that I bought in that era. It's just so funny how we accumulated all that crap, and we always looked for the biggest house. Even though we were just two people at that point, and we had only been together and married for about four years at the time, Heidi and I were looking for something that was big, something that was monstrous. And looking back, I'm so glad that we never got it. We got a very small home because we got a really good deal on it. And I'm glad that we did because I would have filled whatever I had with a ton of stuff that I didn't need. So why is it that we were taught that it was a competition and that we needed to gain so much and make so much money? Well, this is where it begins to start to sound like a conspiracy theory, and I don't mean it to feel that way, but it's the way I feel. I really think that there's a, a upper echelon of earners out there, people that might be categorized as the 1% that are making $275,000 or more a year. They need the workers. They need the people at McDonald's. They need the people to work and fix your air conditioning, to work, fix your plumbing, to fix your car, to sell the car, to detail the car, to work at the gas station, to work at the restaurant. They need those people so those people can rent their properties, buy their cars from their dealerships, to pay the taxes that are needed to run the government that they're involved with heavily. Again, not wanting it to sound like conspiracy, but it's definitely a message that has been pushed over generations that we need to continue to put our nose to the grindstone and work hard so we can get whatever morsels are given to us so we can survive and get more things and buy more things. Well, this video is to tell you guys, you don't need to do that. Heidi and I's channel here is basically a journal, a video journal of what we've been doing. Some of the stuff might go a little abstract and a little on a tangent, but it's basically in the general senses that we're moving out of our home and into an RV. Now, not necessarily this RV. We picked this up initially, and again, it's part of the process. We're learning as we go what we do like, what we don't like, and this is just another step. In this channel, we're kind of showing you or talking about what it's going to take for Midwesterners to break our cycle of what we've been doing and getting to be where we're full time. Now, in my case, I've already transitioned my job from a job that I did at the home here into mobile income, and it's not very much. But here's the thing. You don't need as much money to be an RVer as you do living at home. And this is coming from somebody who has a house payment that's only $450 a month and utilities that are darn near nothing because we just have natural gas and electricity. We have well and we have a septic system. So as far as the utilities of maybe a New York apartment that it's $1,500 to rent a closet space, we're not in that category. I'm telling you that we have pretty frugal spending that we do at the home here and we don't have a lot of outlay monthly, but we know that we can go RVing full time and yet be under what we're doing here in this lower income county where we don't have high taxes, we don't have high property taxes, and we don't have a lot of expenditures. So if you're thinking about RVing and you're thinking about doing it full time, there is a better way to do things than your normal life, and that is what I'm telling you here on this channel. So as far as being competitive and earning all that money, that's really something that is a sad state to live in. There's some people that like it, there's some people that thrive on it, but there's other ones that just haven't really woken up from what's actually going on around them and not being happy and not understanding why. Because they're going to work, they're earning more money every year, they're buying newer cars, they buy at least a new car every two years, their house is up to date, they have the nicest TV, the nicest stereo, but something's missing and they just keep on working and buying things and it just keeps on making it to where they feel as something's missing. Well, I'm telling you that you might be that type of person like me that finally realized 
you don't have to be competitive. Now, I'm gonna give you an example that has nothing to do with RVing, and it's about competition. I started bowling when I was five years old. My father really pushed the sport, and by the time I was 10 years old, I knew that I wasn't to show emotion when I threw a bad shot. I know that I wasn't supposed to get excited whenever I was throwing a good game because I didn't want to ruin it. You didn't want your heart rate to go up. You didn't want your adrenaline to start pumping. You needed to stay on a level playing field so you could repeat your shots. I knew about tournaments. I knew about strategy. I knew about teamwork. And I was 10 years old and I was doing a sport that was a job and a competition to me. By the time I was in high school, I was on traveling leagues. I don't know how many tournaments I had committed to, but I was always bowling. And it was 70 to 100 games a week that I had to practice all the time to keep my average to where it needed to be so I could stay competitive. Now, when I went in the Army, that kind of went to the wayside for a little bit. But as soon as I got out of the Army, I jumped right back into bowling again. I joined a bunch of different leagues. And there was a time there for a year and a half that I had a non-touring pro card in which I was actually going to pro tournaments and I was making money, I was getting earnings from placing in those tournaments and I would travel all over the state for anything that was thrown my way and the leagues that I were in, everything was competitive. Now I had good camaraderie with the other guys just like any other team would. You know, you had friends and you had relationships that you built with teammates and people that you bowled with. But for the most part, I wasn't having a lot of fun. Now, whenever I lost my job from that company, I realized at that point, whenever I was doing my own business, that I'd have to stop bowling because the money that was involved, I was basically spending about $45 a night to bowl, and I did that three nights a week. And on top of that, I had to buy new equipment about three times a bowling season, which was about $200, $250 for a new bowling ball about every month during bowling season. Having my own business, sinking my teeth into my own business, I knew that I'd have to spend all my money towards that business for it to be successful. So I stopped bowling and I quit bowling for quite some time. Um, I don't think that I've bowled in a league now for probably eight years, going probably closer to 10 years now that I think about it. But shortly after I had quit bowling and I was in my own business, I went out with my cousin about three years after not bowling much at all. And he told me, let's go to this Moonlighter Rock and Bowl. And I kind of knew about it, but I never really participated in one. And we went out and had pizza and drinking and had a blast. And then I had that eye-opening aha moment that all my life I'd grown up with a sport that I never saw as recreation, but just as a competition. So those big relief moments as far as stress was concerned, the first time that I found out that I didn't have to work at a desk, I could work doing stuff with my hands, and that relief that came from moving from cubicle world out to a place that I could see sunshine every day was such a great relief. Then whenever I quit the bowling scene and I went out and casually bowled and enjoyed myself was the first time I saw that I wasted all my time focusing on the competition and not enjoying the sport. Then when I lost my job and I started doing my own business at home, it was just such a great relief. It was like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. And I know that a lot of times you hear that, but it really was. And then of course now, whenever I'm coming to the conclusion that we don't have to be in a home, we can travel the country. I'm on another one of those aha moments and I just wanna share that with you. So that's all this video is. If you guys think this is flaky, I understand 100%, but I wanted to tell you where I came from and how I came about the conclusion of being able to do this on our own. Now, we still have a few years that we have in our plan, and I'm not saying don't plan. I'm not saying just quit your job and get an RV and go down the road, because you're gonna find yourself with a vehicle that's broke down, pulling an RV that doesn't have tires that'll go down the road and bearings that are locked up, and you're not gonna have a job or any money to support it. So don't think that's what you should do, but don't plan too long. I'm not that type of a person to where I can just jump and go. And we do have a plan that's in place and we are moving along. Again, that's what we're journaling through this channel. So we have a few more obstacles that we're overcoming and then we're gonna be out on the road. I just wanna help you guys with 
putting out a video that you might have like I did with Ron's video and that is man what am I doing there is another way to do things that's what this video is all about well I hope I didn't let this run too long and as always guys I hope to see you out there bye